we, uh, before we uh, dismiss the children's classes, I wanted to embellish a little bit about uh, this uh, uh, story that Gary was telling about uh, Gail Slater. Now, uh, Gail only comes here like once every, say, six weeks or so. Be she lives in the Los Angeles area, but comes here to house sit from time to time. And when she does, she comes here. And we know her, my wife and I know her over many years. Uh, her son moved to Israel and moved and came to our congregation, Brian Slater. And, uh, and then we had a home group, and so he came to our home group as well. So we got to know uh, her son well. And, uh, and, and he married my secretary at, uh, for my business in Israel. And uh, so we were, you know, we were thick with, that, with him and so on. And he was a registered nurse in the United States and became a registered nurse in Israel. Now, you've got to learn a lot of Hebrew to pass an exam, but he did it. So, uh, but you know, at first I didn't know what to make of Brian because he, was, he seemed like such a giving guy, always self-sacrificing, and I thought, this guy is not real. You know, ever meet somebody like that? You just say, you can't be real, it's just too much, right? But over a period of time, I got the idea that, uh, you know, he wasn't kidding around about it, that he was really dedicated that his life meant something because he was measuring himself by how much can I give. Well, all right. So uh, now along the way, we became acquainted with his mother, and then we understood where Brian got it from. So she shows up here. She's a blessing and so on and so forth. Uh, so about uh, uh, two weeks ago, I think it was, she comes here, as she does periodically, and she, like so many other people, want to bless the people by cooking or providing something for the Oneg Shabbat. And so she comes in, she brought, she had the 31 avocados that she made into guacamole. And we started saying, what is it, what is a guacamole, what, what does an avocado cost in a store? A dollar a piece, uh-huh. And then, uh, then she comes in with this uh, Hebrew national salami, which is also very expensive. And so we started adding up, what is she bringing? Because we know she doesn't have any money. Or, you know, I mean, she's just kind of working week to week, you know. Uh, we had it up at about 50, between 50 and $60 to just quietly come in and make her contribution to the congregation. And it makes you stop and think about how many other people are doing the same thing. They want to bless the congregation, huh? And the Onik Shabbat is not only enjoyed by the people, but it's an opportunity to bless that many people do. And we thank every one of you that does it. Let's all applaud the people who <laughs> serve and and who bring things in service as well. Hiawatha told me the other week we had, uh, nine, by actual count, 96 people served. Um, and not everyone came back to it. Some people just left before, before um, without, without uh, coming for an ash. So, uh, so we're talking with, uh, with Gail Slater, and uh, she says, you know, I really have a troubling matter. She says, uh, uh, there was a stoplight. It says no turn on red. She lives in the Los Angeles area. And she turns red, I guess not observing the sign. It, it happens. And lo and behold, the, the video recorder, uh, you know, photographs it and so on and so forth. She gets a ticket, and the ticket is $1,000. It wasn't speeding. It wasn't speeding. It was turning right on a red that you're not, per that you're not permitted to do so. $1,000. Well, she doesn't have $1,000. Okay. She can't get $1,000. So she's gonna. So she's facing. You know, what, what, how am I gonna drive from house to house to earn any money if I don't have a car and I can't pay the fine? So she had no choice but to show up in court uh, to plead with the judge, right? Your Honor, I don't got the money and I got to make a living. So she goes to court with no choice, and um, so uh, turns out. Oh, but in the meanwhile, she tells us about this, and so we give it as an assignment to our uh, a prayer group that meets uh, every other Wednesday, uh, uh, every other Tuesday here, uh, the second and fourth Tuesdays, and they, they prayed up for Gail and her situation with the $1,000 fine that she was so troubled with. Turns out, the judge says, the case is dismissed because, because it's not clear from the video that it's you or that it's your vehicle. So case dismissed. In the meanwhile, she's driving a 23-year-old automobile, and the same week, 
somebody comes to her, somebody who's known her for some while and knows of this very giving nature of hers. She's, she's a believer, okay? And, and so the Lord is, is in her, and she's, she's wanting to, that's what she wants to do with her life, is to give to other people. So this person knows her for some while and says, you know, she says, uh, um, I, you're driving a 23-year-old automobile. How are you keeping it going? Well, we, we do the best we can. Uh, and uh, so uh, this person says, you know, I have observed over a long period of time of your giving, your giving, and your giving. She says, we got to get you a better automobile. So she goes out and puts out the cash and buys her an automobile that's like six or seven years old, right? It's a fifteen, eighteen thousand dollar car and says, here, it's yours. Somebody needs to thank you for all that you've done with your life. Huh? So this should be an encouragement for those of you who sign up those cards with a prayer request. Okay. This works for Gail. Okay. Let's see. Let's see what else I can announce sometime in the future about these answered prayers, huh? Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, now, see, that's a testimony to the Lord for Gail. Boy, what's that worth, huh? Uh, okay. So uh, I want to call the children forward. And Carol Slayton will come forward. Huh? And Stanley and Terry, come on. Terry, come on forward. Okay. Why don't you tall guys here with these, with this uh, makeshift papa? Okay. So when we have uh, children that are uh, over 12 years old, we have special classes also for, for two different age groups now. So, uh, Terry, why don't you pray, please, for the class. Father, we just thank you today for these children, Lord. You say you train them up in the way they should go. And when they're old, they won't depart far off from you. Lord, we just thank you for that, Lord. We, uh, we call on our position, Lord, to do that, Lord, as we desire to see good things for these young people, Lord. As they go forth and learn of you, oh, Lord, that you be a part of their life forever. And that uh, you will just be big in their life smooth out the paths that they go through, Lord. All the things that they go, and they will be light and salt wherever they go. And we just thank you for it, Lord. It has to begin somewhere, Lord, and it begins here, Lord. It begins in the home with their parents, Lord, that brought them here, and the love that they're showing, Lord. We just thank you for it as we continue this, that they would go and uh, tell all the world. We just thank you for it. And bless the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. Uh, now we're celebrating, we're celebrating the holiday of Purim, and uh, uh, we're uh, we're going to be uh, talking and uh, discussing it, and so on and so forth. The Purim uh, refers to uh, a pur is a, a dice, a lot, drawing lots, okay, which is part of the story here, all right. And uh, as we as we're going to get to in chapter nine. It is a peoplehood holiday. It is not part of the seven commanded feasts that Jews are called upon to celebrate throughout our generations. Gentiles can celebrate it, but it's a specific assignment to Jewish people. In Leviticus 23, it talks about these seven festivals. And, uh, but Purim is, it says, anyone who will not celebrate Purim will be cut off from his people. So it's a peoplehood holiday. And uh, to stay within uh, the definition of being Jewish people, it's, this is a holiday that you're called upon to celebrate. Not because of its, it's great, it be not because it's a foreshadowing uh, a, a holiday like the others or a prophetic holiday. It's not a it's not a commanded feast, but it's a peoplehood holiday. Uh, so, but for these seven feasts, uh, you know, we we do celebrate them, and we celebrate for them too because it's a matter of retaining membership in the Jewish community. You know, if, if, if you can fall out of being part of, of uh, the Jewish heritage by not celebrating Purim, 
maybe by, maybe suppose you're a Gentile and you choose to celebrate Purim, as many of you here are here today, maybe that's a way of kind of including yourself in with the Jewish people. And for that, you know, we thank you that, you know, so many people want to be included in with the biblical saga, be identified with the Jewish people. It's center stage, increasingly so. So it's, uh, it's uh, so in, uh, when I think of it that way, I think of it as a holiday, both for Jewish people and uh, Gentiles, and especially when we consider that Esther is a, a symbol of the Kehillah, the church at large, and Mordecai is a symbol of the kinsman redeemer. Okay. I got a number of telephone calls this week, as, as I normally do. So when do you guys celebrate Easter? <laughs> How do you celebrate Easter? What's the deal with you guys on Easter? So I'm going to answer the question. Okay. Then when people ask you, you can answer the question. Okay. Easter is, uh, the, the word Easter comes from uh, the, the uh, goddess of Estri. Estri was a fertility goddess. Okay. And so with the changing of the seasons and so on and so forth, Estri was worshipped as a fertility goddess. That's why we have the Easter egg, fertility, and the bunny rabbit, also a symbol of fertility. Okay. Easter is not mentioned in the Bible. It is a pagan holiday. But back in the day, in the first, second, and third centuries, there was trying, trying to make it acceptable to the Gentiles. Let's fuse it in with these other holidays and hey, you know, we'll, 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 we'll celebrate the resurrection and we'll make it part of Easter. That's how it happened with kind of a, hey, it'll be all right, you don't have to give up Easter. Just come and become a Christian. So that's where we get it, but it's not in the Bible. But what happened was, as, this, as there was the separation between the Jews and the Gentiles, uh, the Gentiles lost track of when was Passover, 14th day of Nisan. When the heck is that? We've got to go find a Jew. Do you know any Jews? I don't know any Jews. I don't associate with Jews. So, so, the, so the dates got celebrated, got, got separated. Oh, let's, when are we going to do it? Well, it's convenient to meet on Sunday. We'll have Easter on Sunday. Huh? Okay. Well, it's the first day of the week, and, 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 and that was Resurrection Day. So there was kind of a making it up, but not according to the Bible. Well, okay. Now, is God condemning the people who celebrate Easter? No, because they are with their whole heart celebrating the resurrection. Hallelujah. Well, when do you guys, the Messianics, celebrate the resurrection? We, clearly, we talk about resurrection all the time. We're all aiming for resurrection. And those who don't know Yeshua, they don't know for resurrection. But we, who are believers, we count on it. We know. We don't just think we're going to be resurrected. We know for sure we're going to be resurrected. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. So, well, when do you guys celebrate it? Remember I said that there were these uh, biblical feasts, seven of them? Huh? All right. So let's, let's rehearse from the beginning. We have Passover coming up fast. We've got a flyer out there, all right, on the 23rd. You've got, you got Passover, and then you've got the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then the third one is First Fruits. Okay, followed by... You know, seven weeks later, you've got Pentecost, and then the latter fall holidays, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. But the third one is first fruits, okay? After deliverance from Egypt on the Passover, remember the angel Pesach Passover, and, and then we have the unleavened bread, okay, the holiday, all right, where we're delivered out from slavery, huh? And then... First fruits. They didn't know what, what the heck is first fruits. Well, they thought it was a harvest festival, but actually it was foreshadowing the first fruit, the first resurrection, which is Yeshua. The first resurrection, the first fruit of the atonement. The, there's the blood of atonement necessary, okay, to shed blood as a sacrifice for all mankind, okay, and the first fruit is Yeshua's resurrection. We are latter fruits, but the first fruits is the third. So that's how we celebrate it, is we celebrate the holiday of first fruits, and we do so in combination. So we kind of celebrate all three festivals at the same time. Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, first fruits are all in this compressed period of uh, a short period of time, and that's how we celebrate 
the resurrection. We celebrate it as first fruits, as the third holiday of the year. Okay, we're uh, well on our way to having a long service today, as I promised. Okay, so um, um, let's, uh, before we go any further, let's put things in right order. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning. Breath of spiritual life. Ruach HaKodesh, you did breathe upon us, and behold, all things did become new. You said that if we would invite you into our heart and life, if we would invite you into our, if we would invite you into our heart and life, you would come into us, into us, and impregnate us with your Holy Spirit, and behold, there would be a new creation. This has happened to those of us who have had the courage to invite you in. And behold, your yoke is easy, your burden is light. The world doesn't think so, but we know that your burden is easy. Your yoke is easy and your burden is light. We ask, Lord, that uh, since you wrote the scriptures, recorded them through the prophets and the writings and Moses, we ask that you would make them come alive, make, make the verses count. We'll just... Ask that you'll do this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Now, the feast of es the uh, the holiday of Purim actually is kind of a three-part holiday. And uh, on your Messianic calendars, by the way, the new ones are are coming um, well in advance of uh, September. But the uh, the first. Uh, the first day is called the Feast of Esther. It's on the 13th day of Adar 2. Okay. Adar 2. Uh, once every 11 years, there's an extra month added because of the lunar calendar. So it's 13th day of Adar. All right. The, uh, the 14th is called Purim. So we have Feast of Esther, okay, or the Fast of Esther, and then we have Purim. And then the third day is the 15th day of Adar, which is called Shushan Purim. Why, why? What's that about? Well, there was uh, Esther's, Esther's fast and Esther's prayers and so on, and that's part of the celebration. And then uh, you see on the calendar that it talks about uh, the deliverance of the Jewish people, which is primarily the story of the book of Esther. But they couldn't celebrate until the following day when the wall, Shushan was a walled city until those, wa uh, where they were kind of ghettoized and where the walls were broken down and they could fully celebrate throughout the country. So that's called Shushan Purim, which is the third part of the holiday. Uh, but it's common to celebrate it just on, on one day. So uh, we, have, uh, we have many verses to cover and um, but uh, we should start with uh, chapter 1 and verse 2. And Brian's going to show them quickly on the, on the um, video projection. But I hope that you'll follow me in your, in your Bibles. Chapter 1 and verse 2 says that in those days when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan the, the palace, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto his princes and his servants, uh, the power of Persia and Media, Media, Persia, uh, kingdom, the nobles and princes, the providence, provinces being before him. And verse 5 says, And when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the peoples that were present in Shushan, the city, the palace, uh, both the great and the small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. So we have, uh, you know, media Persian empires overcome the Babylonian empire, and the king is uh, has a feast. Everybody's invited, and it's a long feast. Lots of drinking going on there. Okay, in verse ten it says, "On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry." That means this guy is really, he's, he's just consumed a lot of liquor. He, he commanded, 
uh, his people, the seven chambermaids that uh, served in the presence of Ahasuerus, the king. To bring Vashti, the queen, before the king with a crown royal to show the people and the uh, princes her beauty, for she was fair to look upon. But the queen refused to come to the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned him. It's assumed by many that she was commanded to come and parade her beauty in the nude. She didn't want to do it. Then the king says to the wise men, to the wise men which knew the times, for so was the king's manner towards he, who he knew the law and the judgment, and the next came, uh, came to him the seven princes of Persia and Media, which saw the king's face and uh, which sat in the first in the kingdom. What shall we do unto the queen? She's disobeyed you according to the law, because she hath not performed the commandment of the Hasuerus by the, by the chamberlains. So this is a very bad precedent. Are you going to show yourself to be a henpecked husband? If you can't even, I mean, if you can't even get your wife under control, how can we respect you as a king? I mean, if you let this slip, you're done for. Your authority has been will have been successfully challenged. So um, now we come to verse twenty to verse fifteen, uh, and. Uh, in verse 15, it says, Now when uh, the, uh, the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of uh, Mordecai, yay, uh, he had taken, so uh, it comes time, and Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. So Esther was taken uh, unto the king Ahasuerus into his house royal in the tenth month, uh, the tenth month, which is the month of Tibeth uh, in the seventh year of his reign. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than the other virgins. So that when he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti, Vashti did a no-no. She lost out, and Esther was full of grace and favor and and now she, here's a, here's a Jewish girl who's getting married to the king. Then the king made a great feast unto all the princes and the servants, even Esther's feast. And he made a release to the provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the king. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai, yay, sat at the king's gate. All right. Esther had not yet shown her kindred or, nor her people as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther did uh, the commandment of Mordecai yeah. like as when she was wrought up with him. In, in those days, while Mordecai yeah. s sat at the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, uh, of those which kept the door, were uh, angry and sought to lay hands on the king of Ahasuerus. So here's, here's Mordecai, yeah. and he's, he, so he's, so he's, he's sitting at the gate, and uh, he, overhears, he overhears some people who have decided to assassinate, to lay hands on the king Ahasuerus. They're not aware of the fact that, that he is uh, overhearing this, and so he goes to his niece, uh, Esther, and, uh, and says, Psst. Uh, I, there are these two guys, and they, you know, they're looking to kill the king. And uh, maybe you could tell the king about this. And Esther certified the king thereof in the name of Mordecai. Yay. And so inquisition was made of the matter. It was found out. Therefore, they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the chronicles before the king. So, this was this was a good thing. Now. Uh, as we uh, as we head into chapter three, verses one through nine, we learn more. After these things, did King Ahasuerus promote Haman? <laughs> the son of Hamaditha, the Agagite. That's going to become important later. He's the son of an uh, of of Agag, so he's an Agagite. 
and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed in reverence to Haman. For the king had so commanded. But Mordecai eh, bowed not, nor did him reverence. So uh, we got a bad guy here who's been raised to second in command, and everybody's supposed to bow down to him. Verse 3, then the king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said unto Mordecai, Why do you transgress against the king's commandment? You're supposed to bow down, like, like Ahasuerus said. And uh, now it came to pass when they daily spoke unto him, and he hearkened unto them, not unto them, that they told Haman, whether Mordecai, well, that he's not bowing down. And it was told, and what, he's a Jew. You know, the Jews just don't conform. Verse 5, and when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed, down, bowed not, nor did in reverence, then Haman was full of wrath. And he thought, scorn to lay hands on Mordecai, yea, alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom. So that's the problem. He's Jewish. That's why he doesn't conform. And we have to put an end to this. Everybody has to bow down. If we let, if we let him get away with it, before you know it, somebody else will say, well, I don't feel like bowing down either. And then there'll be other Jews. You know, the Jews have been a problem in this kingdom. And so we can't let that go. Okay. So here we have a situation shaping up against the Jews. Uh, in the, uh, verse 7 it says, in the first month, that is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, that they cast uh, lots, Purim, Pur, that is the lot before Haman, from day to day and month to month to the twelfth month there, there is. And Haman said unto King Ahasuerus, there is a certain piece, that are all, you know, they get together for a dice game daily, and... Uh, there's a certain people scattered among, abroad among, dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are diverse uh, from all the other peoples. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore, it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. They're not assimilating. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. O king, O worthy king, they are not bowing down, and therefore... We should, not, we should get rid of not just this one, but let's get rid of all of them. They all may come to be a problem eventually. So the plot's afoot, and so on. And uh, oh, it brings us to chapter 4 already. And chapter 4, we see when Mordecai Yay. perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out to the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry and came even before the king's gate that, might, that none might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and decree went, there was a great mourning among the Jews because they were, it was policy. It was policy to get rid of the Jews now. Sound familiar? And fasting and weeping and wailing, and, men, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So when Esther's maids uh, and her chamberlains came and told it to her, then was the queen exceedingly grieved, and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai, yea, and take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. Uh, look, you're making a spectacle, uncle. Uh, and uh, you're here, you know, you're not supposed to be in sackcloth and ashes at the king's gate. It, it, it's, it's, it's just not flattering to the king. So here's, here's some new clothes for you. No, I'm going to be here officially in mourning for what is happening and uh, about to begin happening among our people. Verse 5 of chapter 4, Then Esther for Hatash, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend on, upon her and give him commandment to Mordecai, hey, to know what was done and why. So Hatash, 
went forth to Mordecai, yea, unto the street of the city that was before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of, of all that had happened unto him and the sum of the money at, that Haman had promised to pay the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. Ah, now we're seeing why, why our villain was made second in command. Uh huh. It was a money thing. He promised to pay the king's treasuries. That's the secret to his popularity with the king. He's a big time contributor. These things have always been with us. Okay. And he gave him the copy of the writings of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, the Jews, to show it unto Esther, and to declare it unto her, and to charge her that she should go into the king to make supplication unto him and to make request before him for her people. Remember, it's not that well commonly known that she's Jewish, but now Uncle Morty is, sa <laughs> is saying, look, you're in a key position now. This is, this is it. Go in and on behalf of your people. And Hatash came and told Esther's words of Mordecai. And again, Esther spake unto Hatash and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. Yeah. All right. And the king's servants and so on. They went into the provinces and so on and so forth. Well, uh, as it turns out, uh, then Mordecai, verse 13, that was weak. <laughs> <laughs> we got to keep the rest of you awake. So then, then, uh, uh, Mordecai <laughs> commanded to answer Esther, Think not for thyself that thou shalt escape from the king's house more than any of the other Jews. You think that uh, you know, they're going to let you go? The word will come out that you're Jewish too. You're going to get consumed with the rest of us. Verse 14 says, uh, For if you altogether holdeth your peace, in other words, if you don't speak up at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knows whether you've come, whether thou art come into the kingdom for such a time as this, which is a famous verse, and really true, okay, that hinging upon this one woman put in this, by providence, uh, she was given her beauty for a reason. And that by providence she was put in this unique place of influence and by providence that she had this particular uncle who could give her this particular advice. So, verse 16, go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast with me and neither eat nor drink these three days and nights. I also and my maidens will fast likewise and so I go into the king which is not according to the law and if I perish, I perish. Another famous verse. So there's three days of fasting that she calls upon for she and her women servants because she's going in, and you know how the king is. Is he in a good mood or is he in a bad mood? Okay. If he, if he raises his scepter favorably, she lives. If he's annoyed, what the heck do you want? Can't you see I'm drinking? Uh, can't you see I'm busy? <laughs> uh, then she's, she's dead. So she's, she's now being called upon by Uncle, Morty, uh, by Uncle Morty Yay! <laughs> to do this, but her life is on the line. Even just to talk to the king is a risk at, without, without being called. This is her idea, not his. That's a no-no. Okay, verse 5. It says, Now it came to pass on the third day that Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house, and over to king's house, and the king came upon his royal throne, the royal house, and so on. And so uh, then the king, in verse 3, it says, And then the king uh, said unto her, Wilt thou, Queen Esther, what, what, is, what is your request? And Esther answered, verse 4, If it seems good unto the king, let the king and Haman come to this day unto a banquet that I have prepared for him. So she has a plan. So she says, let's have a banquet, and this man that you honor above all the other men, let's have a banquet for him. Then the king says, well, cause Haman 
haste. Make haste that he may do as Esther has said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that that Esther had prepared. You know, Esther is really the Englishized version. Her real name was Hadassah. Her Hebrew name was Hadassah. Hadassah got Englishized to Esther. I like Hadassah. You know, like a Hadassah hospital, you think Israeli here, right? Think Hadassah. I like Hadassah. It sounds so nice. Okay. I don't know Jewish girls by the name of Esther. I guess I do. I guess I do. So there are English girls and American girls named Esther, but their Hebrew name actually is Hadassah. Okay. So, uh, so th- there's the uh, there's the banquet with the wine. It says in verse six, and uh, and now at the banquet, uh, the question is, what is your what is your petition, and it shall be granted unto thee. Again, at these banquets, you know, Ahasuerus he has he has a little a little a little wine, maybe more than a little wine, and it shall be granted unto your request. Then answered Esther in verse seven and said, my petition is, and my request is, if I found favor in your sight. And if it please the king to grant my petition and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I shall prepare for him, and I will do to, uh, to the, uh, and I will do tomorrow as the king has said. Then went Haman forth that day joyful and with glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai at the king's at the king's gate, then he stood up. That he stood up. Uh, he didn't move for him. He didn't bow down and was full of indignation. How dare you not bow down to me? Can't you see that I am second only to the king? And you are oh, such arrogance. You're not bowing down. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself. And when he came home, he sent uh, and called his friends Zeresh and his wife. And Haman, in verse 11, told him of the glory of the riches of the multitude of his children and of all the things wherein the king had promoted him and how he he had advanced him above all of the other princes. Haman said, Moreover, yea, Hadassah, the queen, did let no man come in with the king and to the banquet that she had prepared but for myself. And tomorrow I am invited unto uh, her also with the king. Okay. So, not only is there the feast, and ostensibly Haman is going to be honored, but now he's, he, he's being called to a private meeting with uh, Adasa and Ahasuerus. Yet all this availeth me nothing because it still bothers me. They're all, I'm a special guy. The king and the queen have invited me to a private audience and so on. I'm raised above all the other people. But it says it doesn't count for anything because it is so annoying that this Mordecai, Yay. the Jew, is sitting at the gate and he doesn't bow down to me. So, uh, then said Zeresh's wife and to all his friends under him, let a gallows be built 50 cubits high, uh, and tomorrow that, the, that Mordecai yeah, will be hanged. That's the answer. That's the answer. I'm going in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see the king and the queen. I'm making me a special request that there be a gallows built, and we are going to hang this guy for not bowing down so others will know that that doesn't work, that you have to bow down. All right, because I am a special individual. I'm special. Everybody needs to bow down to me. You know, there's still people like that. Maybe we know some of them. So Haman's Haman has a plan for a gallows. Gonna do in Mordecai. <laughs> okay. Chapter 6. On that night could not the king sleep, and he commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles that were read before the king. Insomnia. And it was found that Mordecai had told of these two assassins, two of the chamberlains and keepers of the door, who sought to lay hands on the king Ahasuerus. And so Ahasuerus says, well, what what has been done to honor and dignify that which was done to Mordecai for this. Then said the king's servants and ministered unto him, well, actually, nothing has been done. And the king said, who who is in the court? Now Haman 
was come into the outer court of the king's house to speak to the king to hang Mordecai hey. on the gallows that had been prepared for him. And the king's servants said unto him, Behold, Haman, he's here standing in court. And the king said, Well, show, send, him, send him right in. Show him in. So Haman came in, and the king said to him, What shall be done? What do you, what do you think should be done to the man who honors the king and delighteth and honor him? So Ahasuerus is actually talking about how can I, how can I honor Mordecai? But Haman says, oh, he's talking about how to honor me. And so Haman thought in his heart, to whom would the king's delight to do to honor more than myself, he thought to himself. Verse 7, and Haman answered the king, for the man uh, who delights and, uh, and to honor, uh, that you want to honor, and so on and so forth, why, I think it would be good for the royal apparel to be brought, uh, which the king uses to wear. Take the king's apparel. And uh, uh, so that this uh, honored individual uh, should be able to uh, w wear the king's garments and, uh, and that a horse be provided, uh, uh, the horse of the king. So it's not good enough that I'm the second in command. Uh, you know, actually, I know, oh, Ahasuerus, you are the king and I am only number two. But it would be good for whoever it is that you're going to honor. <laughs> of course, it could be me. Uh, but, uh, but the one that you're, that you're going to honor, you know, that he should wear your clothing and he should ride on your horse through the streets of the city. Uh, that would be fitting to honor somebody that you want to honor. And, and King Ahasuerus says, yeah, I can, I can picture Mordecai doing that. Yay! Verse 9. And let this apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of the one of the kings of the most noble princes, that they may array this man uh, with all the kings delighteth and honor him and bring him on horseback through the streets and proclaim to him, Thou shalt be done to the man who the king delighteth to honor. So when the, when the king says something according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, it's got to be because the king's word must be taken as, as always fulfilled. Then, verse 10, it says, The king said to Haman, Make haste, hurry up and take the apparel and the horse and uh, do even with uh, do this with take the horse and take my garments. Yes, good idea. And uh, take this and right away give it to Mordecai the Jew. Yay. Mordecai the Jew, the guy who won't bow down to me. I thought it was going to be for me. Yeah, he's the guy who sits at the king's gate. Let not, let nothing fail of any of this. Everything that you said. That's a good idea, Haman. That. That 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 that'd be a good way to honor, to honor Mordecai. Yay! Put him on horseback, lead him through the city, give him my garments, and so on and so forth, and and proclaim how honored he is. So, um, so things are backing up. Chapter seven and verse two says, and the king said again unto es Hadassah on the second day at the banquet of wine, uh, what's your petition, Queen Hadassah? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? And it shall be performed even to the half of my kingdom. He's pretty well loaded here. It's the second day of the banquet. He's had all day to drink the day before. And he's feeling mellow. And so, <laughs> so he, uh, uh, in verse 6, he says, and, and Esther said, The adversary and the enemy is this wicked man, Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. So now the queen is saying to the king, it's Haman that's the bad guy. He's the one that's got it in for my people. In, uh, in verse 7, uh, and excuse me, in verse 10, it says, So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Yay. Then the king wrath was pacified. Justice will out. Justice will out. God is just and cannot be anything but just, even when it doesn't seem like we understand what's going on. Hallelujah.
chapter 8, verse 2 and 7. And the king took off his ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it unto Mordecai. And Adasa set Mordecai over the house of Haman. So Mordecai Yay. inherits the whole house of Haman. All of his goods, all of his prestige, all of his garments, all of his silver, all of his gold, all of the, his wealthy, wealthy contributor now winds up in the hands of this guy who sat at the, at the king's gate. Kind of a, almost a, like a beggar. And he now goes to exaltation. Isn't it interesting? This kingsman redeemer, huh? What happened to him? He was raised up from being a schlepper to being second, I guess maybe to God the Father, to King Ahasuerus. All right. Um, now, verse 7, it says, Then the king Ahasuerus said unto Hadassah the queen, and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Hadassah the house of Haman, and him they have hanged upon the gallows because he has laid hands on the Jews. Okay? And Hashuera says, what the heck? I, uh, you know, I was, I was, I was going to do what he said and have the Jews wiped out. Huh? Always somebody who's trying to get rid of the Jews. <laughs> Chapter 9. Chapter 9. We can see some parallels with what happened 70, 75 years ago, can't we? Okay, chapter 9, verse 12. And the king said unto Hadassah the queen, The Jews have slain and destroyed 500 men in Shushan, the palace. So the king says, look, you know, I know that there was a decree that anybody who wants to can kill a Jew. But you know what? Maybe what you Jews should do is get busy killing some of the, guy, some of the other ones. You're, I, I implore you to defend yourselves. Huh? Isn't it interesting how only a year after this happens, Ezra, the scribe, is commissioned to take, to take tens of thousands of people and go and rebuild the city, uh, to rebuild the temple? It's only a year later, okay? That first there's a disaster. We could make that parallel with the Holocaust, which immediately precedes the creation of the state of Israel. Huh? Isn't it again, isn't it a parallel uh, that, that there was the attempted destruction of the Jews and immediately thereafter comes the, the, uh, the, the decree to rebuild the temple? You know, how often it happens that before great blessing, there is an attempt to wipe us out, kill us off, do something terrible, destroy our faith, do something that just, it, that we can't understand. So sometimes when we're going through real trial and tribulation, it is and could even be sometimes an indication that it's the eve of blessing. God has a modus operandi, and there are laws of spiritual physics. And so we learn something about the modus operandi of God. So we have, uh, we're coming down to the end here, and we have, uh, then Esther said, If it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews which are in Shushan to do tomorrow according to the law's decree, and let Haman's sons be hanged on the gallows. So, Ham so Haman's, even his progeny, even his progeny is to be wiped out. Ten sons. And so um, the king commanded that this be done, and the decree was given in Shushan that they hanged Haman's ten sons. On the thirteenth day of the month of Hadar, and on the fourteenth day of the same rest of the day, and made it a day of feasting and gladness. So, so Purim is a day of gladness. Okay. Verse 24 says, Because Haman... The enemy of the Jews had devised against the Jews to destroy them and had cast per lot, that is, lots, to consume them and destroy them. Uh, wherefore, verse 26, they, uh, we call this day the day of Purim, multiple lots. 
after the, the name of Pur, therefore, for all the words of this letter and that, that they be seen according to this matter and which shall come unto them. In other words, you're going to celebrate this holiday of the, the casting of lots uh, a, a, at the king's gate. In verse 28, uh, we, we have had these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation. Really, every generation. And it's been kept throughout every generation. What a tribute to the Lord. The Lord can keep this going, despite everything. Throughout every generation, every family, every province, every city, that these days of Purim should not fall from among the Jews, nor the memorial of them should perish from their seed. That's us, their seed. Okay. So that's why we have this holiday that we celebrate throughout our generations. Finally, in chapter 10, we have verse 3. For Mordecai, yay, yay, the Jew was next unto King Ahasuerus and great among the Jews and, accept, and accepted of the multitudes of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people and speaking peace to all his deeds. Look what happened and look at the exaltation of the kingsman redeemer of Mordecai. Yay. Can we not see what happened? There was this schlepper at the gate. He, people don't think much of him and so on, but he has wisdom. He has wisdom, and he has influence over what is to become the church. Okay? And, and he, there are people who are plotting against God Almighty, and he says, Psst, church. I, sh I, I don't want to use the word church, but, I'll, but sh church. You see what's going on? You see how they're attacking God? Huh? Yeah, they're, they're out to destroy the king. Uh, you can see the parallel. And this kingsman redeemer, he goes to straighten this, this slander out. Hmm? And so there was a thing to destroy him, an attempted destruction of the kingsman redeemer. That's like Yeshua too. Huh? But what happens to this kingsman redeemer? He's raised up to... He's, he's second to God the Father, to the King Ahasuerus, okay? And he's given all the wealth and all the power and all the prestige. And his enemy, his enemy was hung on a tree. And that is a sign of humiliation. So, those who sinneth are hung on a tree. That's an instruction from the scriptures. Okay, so what are we to uh, what are we to make of this? Well, I have uh, I have a few more scriptures. Uh, Brian will put them on the board. Uh, that we have First uh, Samuel fifteen, two and three, and eight through eleven. I should put them. Okay. Now, why was now who was this Haman? Who, who was he? How did he get that way? What kind of a mean streak? What, what, what kind of defective person was like this? That everybody's got to bow down without exception. There's something wrong with his character. Why? I mean, how did he, why, why was he that way and how did he get that way? Okay. Well, there is a, a, po there is a possible explanation. Remember how it says he was an Agagite. That meant that he was in the progeny, he was a descendant of Agog. Who was Agog? Well, it turns out that way previous to this, when the Jewish people had spent the 40 years in the wilderness, okay, that they were coming to go into the promised land, but they had to go through the land of Edom. Okay, so... In Jordan today, you have Moab, Ammon, Edom. Edom is in southern Jordan. So they had to go up through into, into Edom to cross over the river Jordan to get into the promised land. Okay. But here we have the Amalekites, okay, that, that they laid wait for them and came up, and came up from Egypt. Now they... Uh, they they were out, and they said, no, you can't go into the promised land. We're not going to allow you to come through to tread on our real estate to get into the promised land. You're going to have to go around us. You're not coming through here. We're going to thwart you. Okay.
So Agog, the Amalekite, who is a descendant of Esau. Esau is Edom. Okay? Esau becomes the land of Edom, okay, which becomes the place of the Amalekites. The king of the Amalekites was Agog. Okay? Agog says, not through my real estate. So now they've got to go all the way around and got to go all the way further north to enter into the promised land. And so there's a curse. There's a curse upon, upon the descendants, the Amalekites. All right? And so now what happens is uh, it comes down to uh, there's, a, there's a time in 1 Samuel where it talks about uh, that King Saul is asked to, uh, to, king, uh, to kill off the Agagite, the Amalekite, and to, and to slaughter all the, uh, the animals and so on and so forth. But King Saul doesn't do exactly that. He kind of does it, but doesn't really follow the instruction completely. I, you know, there's, there's valuable as wealth and so on. And I'm going to let the king live too. Uh, good guy. I mean, he's a, But he didn't follow instructions. You see, God knew that all of the descendants, all of the descendants of the Amalekites, who were Edom, who were descendants of Esau, that they're wearing a curse, and that the king, Agog, the Amalekite, okay, and his descendants, that they would all be bearing the curse of what was done way back when, okay, when Agog, the king, said, you cannot enter, I'm going to stop you from entering the promised land. Okay, we got it. Esau, Edom, Amalekites, king, Agog, won't let them come through his, his territory. And because of that crime of not letting the chosen people under Moses come through and enter into the promised land, there was a curse upon those people forevermore. And God said, wipe them all out. If you don't wipe them all out now, it's going to be a problem later. And sure enough, it turned out to be a problem later. God knew what he was doing, and Saul messed up badly. And over this, Saul lost his kingdom. So God means something very serious here if you are among those who are preventing people from coming into the promised land. Well, let me see. There are some people today who are trying to thwart the Jewish people from coming into the promised land. There is a curse upon them. Many of them are descendants of Esau. And there is a curse upon their lineage. And they will always be against and will always be attempting to thwart the Jewish people from coming into the promised land. If you don't know that, where have you been for the last 68 or 70 years? And now you say, well, oh, my God, this is mind-blowing. Because this is, this, is, this is serious business. Saul could lose his entire kingdom over this minor discrepancy. I, I more or less, for the most part, but it's, serious, it's a serious crime. And, and Agog made this, this error in judgment. And all of his descendants will pay a penalty and will suffer a curse because of it. Boy, do they need the blood of atonement to get rid of that curse? Only thing that's going to solve the curse for you is to have the blood of atonement. And you know what? There are a few, there are a few Palestinians who have maybe accepted Yeshua as the Messiah, but not many. Okay? There's a curse that goes with blocking the Jewish people from coming into the promised land. And that's on a physical level. What about on a spiritual level? Remember, there is a parallel between that which is a physical and that which is the spiritual. Okay? We get the idea of the physical so that we'll know that the spiritual is true. Ah! The parable works. So there's the parable of Jews prevented from coming into the physical promised land, and blocking that, there's a curse upon it. Well, what about, what about the people who, on a spiritual level, want to go to heaven? That's the promised land. huh? So, so here's, here's, here's uh, Joe Schmo, or uh, Seymour Schwartz, huh? Menachem Kelly, whoever it is, okay? They're curious, and they're thinking about that they want to come, in, that they want to get to heaven. I mean, it's a worthy thing. I want to get to heaven. I'm going through this lousy life, and I want to get to heaven. Can you show me how? What must I do to be saved? Huh? 
Well, let me explain to you about the prophecies. You've got to invite Yeshua into your heart and life. And somebody comes along and says, oh, no, you don't. I want to stop you from doing that. That is a very bad thing. Why, do you realize that you're undermining the Jewish people? Do you realize that you're, that you're subverting the Jewish people? Do you realize you're going to destroy the Jewish people? You're not Jewish anymore. You, you, you are, you, you're out of bounds. I, I don't like you because you are trying to tell this person how to get into heaven, and I don't like that. I don't like that you are trying, you're, you're trying to win them over to your cause to get them to accept the blood of atonement, to accept the prophecy, to accept Yeshua as the Messiah, and I don't like that. I want to stop you any way I can. Yeah, let's applaud because there are plenty of people like that. And the people who try to block people from getting into heaven by saying that the Bible's not true, the prophecies are not true, the tale of Yeshua is not true, they are trying to block people from getting into heaven. And there is a curse that goes with that that will last throughout the generations. It happens. It's happening now. Oh, which side are we on? Are we on the side of those that I could tell you about the people in this room, why we're on the side, we're on the side of helping for the restoration of the Jewish people back to the physical promised land. We do what we can to help Israel. We're loyal to Israel. We got, to, we got us an Israeli flag. And we, uh, yeah, and we, we, we watch the news reports and we're rooting for, we're rooting for Israel. Huh? And we want the Jewish people to be able to come back into the land. And it's happening in our generation. And that's on a physical level. Now we come and we say, well, all right. I understand how it works. That happens to people's physical body. What about their spirit man? That thing that survives the flesh, the central person, the spiritual entity. Oh, well, What happens? Well, it all depends on what they do in this life. Are they willing to take a chance on God? Well, how about... There are some people, most of the people in this room, who would want to help that and say, look, I can help you get into heaven. Will you listen to me? I want you to go to heaven. Can I help you get into heaven? Anything I can do for you? There's nothing in it for us. We just want to help somebody. Huh? But no, I, I, this guy's blocking me. What in the heck? Look at the curse that people are bringing on themselves by trying to prevent people from coming into the kingdom of God. There's a permanent curse on that. It's a spiritual curse. It parallels the physical curse that happened to the Amalekites. And it's serious business with God. That's how things work. That's how things are. And that's why we have these parallels. Okay? Deuteronomy, it's, it, Deuteronomy said, uh, 17 says God remembers. And boy, does he remember. Boy, does he remember. It is not the case of the book of Esther, is this, not, is this not an evidence that God remembers? Is this not an evidence that throughout the generations, the, the fact that our three score and ten, or maybe a little more by extra strength, you know, we're so concerned about our generation, like, oh, it's the important generation. I'm just concerned with what happens in my lifetime. After that, oh, I, I, I'm only concerned. And so we try to work out justice all within our very brief lifetimes, and that's nothing. To God, he's not concerned about three score and 10 or 70 or 80 years or 90 years. That's nothing. He remembers throughout the generations, and he keeps score. He must be just in every instance. He can never be even slightly unjust. Okay? If there's somebody who's suffering from injustice, and there are people here now, or relatives of people here, who are suffering from injustice, okay? God will vindicate. How do I know? The Bible tells me so. Okay? I mean, just think about the slander that was put upon Yeshua. Huh? The slander that was put upon him. You're not really a prophet. You're not. You're, you're Beelzebub. You're healing on Saturday. You're a no-good Nick, and so on. No, you weren't resurrected. Well, I, I got witnesses. I got 500 witnesses, and uh, uh, this is decades later, and there's still 500. It doesn't make any difference. I don't believe you, and I'm going to discredit you, and so on and so forth. And so here it was. Here it was, 2,000 years later, and there's a, bi there's a billion 
there's a billion and a half people who believe Yeshua. A billion and a half. That's to one degree or another. They're believing Yeshua. And it's taken 2,000 years of progress for people to come to get his name cleared. To get his name cleared. But it's taken 2,000 years huh, to get this far for his name to be cleared. In the end, his name will be completely cleared. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. He will be totally cleared of the accusation. It's in progress. It's on the way. God may be slow, but he's very sure. Okay? That's slander. You know, you can't change God's sense of justice. He must perform his sense of justice in every case, or else how could we trust him the next time? This thing about believing God or not believing God dates back to the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden, the central issue was, do you believe me or do you believe the snake? And look at how long it's taken, 6,000 years, for God's name to be cleared. And there are people today on television with great amplification who are saying, no, don't believe the Bible. No, don't believe in God. No, don't believe any of it. It's all a myth. Don't believe him. And they are saying the same thing that the serpent said. Huh? And so God is working on it for 6,000 years to have his name cleared. And that's going to happen as well. And what is the future of the snake? Lower than low. He'll be totally discredited. You see, God must perform that justice or else the serpent, the adversary, will have won. Will have won. I'm telling you, if you're suffering from an injustice today, or maybe it happened 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, not to worry. God's justice will out. There will be a vindication. If you were clearly in the right, and we must clearly know and admit to ourselves whether we were in the right, but if we were, God must perform on his sense of justice. He cannot allow it to ever fail, never, or else we can never trust him the next time. You see, he will do it. It may take a while, but he says, vengeance is mine. Why the delay, God? Well, maybe I'm still holding on to it, and maybe I, maybe I got plans for the justice myself. No. You want God to act, you get rid of the baggage. Okay. You say to yourself, maybe I wasn't such a peach either. Huh? But you're holding up, you're holding up the works. God's vengeance will happen. Justice will be done. If we'll quit hanging on to it, we've got to work on our heads and our hearts to get rid of the baggage so that God can act. God will act. God will vindicate us. He will vindicate our cause. He is busy vindicating the cause of his son, Yeshua. He didn't come here for nothing. He came here so that, so that God's name will be cleared. Yeshua's name is being cleared, and we are on the side of, the, uh, we're on the side of defending his case. Huh? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I'm to, let's, let's, just, let's just say to ourselves, you know what? This Yeshua, this thing about whether he is the Messiah or not, very central, very central. There are the accusers, and there are those who are standing up and saying, no, 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 you got it wrong. And I'm here to tell you, my Messiah lives, and here's the reasons why. We are the defenders we are out there on the front lines. And if we don't speak up, who will? But I know the people in this room are serious people in their faith, committed and wanting to do what they can. And so with our small lives, seemingly, seemingly small lives, we say, as for me and my house, oh, we will stand with the Lord. We're going all the way with this thing. We're going all the way. Praise the Lord. Let's, let's close in a word of prayer. Hallelujah. Lord, we do thank you that you do speak to our hearts, that you well up within us with your sense of righteousness, your sense of justice, your history of when you and how you've performed in the past. We just thank you for this tale of the book of Esther, and we thank you for our time together in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Jerry, uh, uh, Jerry, come on forward with uh, Don Alone. There we go. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't know, Lama, share my life.
Beterem ko yitzir nevra liet nasa vechesocho azay melech shemo nikra v'yachare kiklod hako levado yimloch nora v'hu haya v'hu hove v'hu yiye betifara Behu echad v'yent sheni, v'ham shilo l'hak b'yir, 